Well, this is an anthem that says Black Lives Matter because we have a lot of inequality in our world. Here we go. So here is the reason. Twice as hard. Only just to prove that we are smart. No more will we stand for this type of wrong. And it's because. Talking about the many ways to 
ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to resume. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to resume, and please silence all cell phones. Please welcome Season 19 Top 9 Semi-Finalist on The Voice, Tamara Jade, singing America the Beautiful.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, accompanied by Mr. Harry Johnson, President of the Martin Luther King Jr. National Memorial Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, the 46th President of the United States, Joe Biden, accompanied by Vice President Kamala Harris. Dr. Joe Ratliff will lead us in a, the invocation prayer. May we pray. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, this morning let our glad hearts rise to you. We confess the shadow of our turning from you. The darkness then overwhelms us. Our choices defeat us. We become afraid. We grieve your heart, harm others, and disappoint ourselves. So from your compassions that never fail, but are new every morning, unclench our hearts. Cast away the darkness from our paths. Soften our spirits with gentle grace. Bind our wounds. Touch our brokenness. Open our angry fist. Lance the poison of unforgiveness from our souls. And restore us to full communion with you, with others, and with ourselves. So teach us to know better what time it is in our lives to apply our hearts to wisdom, our hands to service. We applaud this day as we bind ourselves of the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his love for justice for all. May such a worldview broaden our capacity to care for the least and the lost. May justice roll down like a mighty stream and drown our hate, our differences, so it may be. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, to perform, pl please, stay, please stay standing for the performance of Lift, Vo Lift Every Voice and Sing. Please welcome Miss Michelle Fallon, the arrest artistic director for the children of the gospel choir. Full of the faith. 
Fellows, and speaking to Dr. King's Tenants of Hope and Love, please welcome Taylor Cowan of Houston, Texas, to the stage. Good afternoon. I am Taylor J. Cowan, and I'm a first-year law student at Howard University School of Law. <laughs> I first want to thank Mr. Harry Johnson and Mr. Brian Agnew for their dedication, hard work, and commitment to the Memorial Foundation. I am proud to represent the 50 fellows of the inaugural Social Justice Fellowship Program. It is an honor to be here to commemorate Dr. King and speak on a virtue about which I care deeply, love. Dr. King was and continues to be the embodiment of love. Love, as Dr. King most famously said, is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. As many of us have seen time and time again, love really is not the easiest virtue to live up to, especially during a time when discrimination, racism, and division surrounds us. Yet, when faced with the burdens of hatred, violence, and evil, Dr. King still chose to lead with love. When I was in the sixth grade and facing the typical challenges of a 12-year-old middle schooler, my dad first introduced me to a quote by Dr. King. 
The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Although the battle by which I'm confronted may change over time, King's words have provided me with light, meaning, and purpose throughout my life. That quote encouraged me to push past the self-doubt that came along with college and law school admissions, reminding me to love my personal journey, embracing all the ups and downs. King's words challenged me to see the best in everyone I encounter and to remember the good in humanity in spite of what I see on the news. And most importantly, that quote encourages me to be a light for others because at the end of the day, we are all human and could use a little love. As first year law students, we are taught the intricacies of the law. At Howard in particular, we examine and question how the law is written and how laws impact black people and people of color. That said, sometimes it is hard for me to see how love is written anywhere into the law, especially when it is used as a tool to spew injustice and attempt to reverse the progress that people like Dr. King and countless others have worked so hard to gain. <laughs> but what I am constantly reminded of is to never lose hope. Because, as Dr. King said, out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. That was so wonderful. Thank you so much. And we appreciate her being in the inaugural class of our Social Justice Fellow Pro yeah. Fellows Program. Thank you so much. And wow, she's from Houston, Texas. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. Democracy, justice, hope, and love. Those are the four tenets that are were central to Dr. King's vision. These tenets function as a reminder of what we aspire to become and how much further we have to go. Today, our next speaker lives up to Dr. King's four tenets every day as one of the most powerful and influential politicians in our country. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi represented, she represents the 12th Congressional District for California in the House of Representatives for 33 years. In 2007, she made history as the first Speaker of the House, the first woman Speaker of the House. Please give it up for her. Please welcome Speaker of the House, none other than the Honorable Nancy Pelosi. Oh my God, I'm good, I'm good. I'm happy to turn up. I can see you all better. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> Mr. President, Madam Vice President, all the friends of democracy, justice, love, and hope who are here today. And thank you, President Harry Johnson, for your kind introduction. To you and Chairman Guy Vickers, thank you for bringing us together uh, for this beautiful event and your organization's stewardship of these tributes to Dr. King. Let's hear it for Harry Johnson and Guy Vickers. That's an applause line. <laughs> It's always a thrill, I'm sure I can speak for everyone here, it's always a thrill to return to MLK Memorial and to do so today, today as we celebrate 10 years since the dedication when we were joined by President Barack Obama and our former colleague, the beloved Congressman John Lewis. On that day, John Lewis said this, he referred to the monument as a monument to peace, to love, and to nonviolent resistance on the, front yard, on the front yard of America to symbolize the cornerstone of our true democracy. Dr. King's presence on the front yard of America with President Washington, President Lincoln, President Jefferson, well, his presence, while not a, not a president, has brought luster to the front lawn, has brought justice to the front lawn, and has brought many, many more children to the front lawn of America. Today, it is a privilege, I know, for all of us to return to the mall 
but so many who were here for that dedication, so many who played a role in, in the idea and then uh, the fulfillment of that idea of this monument. And that are many members of the Congressional Black Caucus who are here today. They are led by our chair now, Joyce Beatty, and I want them all to rise. The members of the Congressional Black Caucus. <laughs> Thank you for your leadership, and I also want to thank Reverend Martin Luther King III, Mark Mariel, former Mayor Mariel, and Mayor Muriel, Muriel Browser for their participation. And isn't it a thrill and an honor to be here, a privilege to be here with President Biden today? Thank you, President Biden. And how proud are we that we are here with the first woman and the first African-American Vice President of the United States. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Nearly 60 years ago, well, it was actually 58, I remember because I was here, but I couldn't stay to see the speech because I had to leave to go get married. So now I know how many years ago it was, because that's so many years I've been married. But it was such an equation to see so many people converging on Washington, D.C., among others, our dear John Lewis. And to hear that, for people to hear Dr. King, not far from here, deliver his immortal call to action. Now, he said, is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of America's children. So as was said, I'll speak about that democracy. We must make real the promises of democracy for families lacking affordable health care, child care, lacking good paying jobs with dignity and justice. We must make real the, the promise of democracy for Americans denied their right to vote and have equal justice under the Constitution. We must make real the promise of democracy for communities of color facing police violence and racial injustice. We must make real the promise of democracy for our children who deserve a safe, secure, healthy housing and a future and who face environmental injustice. In his books, Strength to Love, Dr. King said, God never intended for one group of people to live in superfluous, inordinate wealth while others live in abject, deadening poverty. That challenge, that call to action, could not be more important than it is today as our president proceeds to build back better. Dr. King often preached that ch change does not roll out on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. From the earliest days of our democracy, freedom-loving people have struggled to create change for our nation. Indeed, the story of America is the story of ever-expanding freedoms in our country. Strengthened by the vision and inspiration and leadership of President Joe Biden, and oh, some applause line, okay? <laughs> and with the great leadership of Vice President Kamala Harris, strengthened by the uh, leadership, inspired by the activism of millions of Americans across the nation who are crying out for hope, love, justice, and democracy and blessed by the example of Dr. King, let us strive to make real his dream and make real the promise of democracy for justice, hope, and love. Thank you all very much. And now, it is my honor to introduce the Vice President of the United States, but I'm going to ask all men of Alpha Phi Alpha to please stand at this time and let the Vice President know that you are in the house. Uh, 
All right, guys. All right. That's enough. That's enough. Yes, he was. So Dr. King was indeed an alpha, and it was the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity that came up with the idea to build this memorial in honor of Dr. King. So we could never take that away from the men of Alpha Phi Alpha. I see y'all down there, the Kappas and Omegas, but it was an alpha idea. I digress. I am sorry. Mr. President, forgive me. Madam Vice President, forgive me. I am not honored to introduce our next speaker, the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Vice President Harris has dedicated her life to public service, having previously been elected District Attorney of San Francisco, California, Attorney General of that state, and the United States Senator and now Vice President. She is the first woman, the first black American, and the first South Asian American to be elected Vice President and was the case with any other officials of offices that she held. The through line from Dr. King to Vice President Harris started for her at an early age when her parents would bring her to civil rights demonstrations. She has said those demonstrations introduced her to her role models, ranging from Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, another man of Alpha Phi Alpha, to civil rights leader Constance Baker Botley, and their work motivated her to become a prosecutor. From her time as an undergraduate student here in Washington, D.C. at Howard University through today, she has been a leader in this country for human rights, and we are so honored to have her here today. Please welcome the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Thank you so much, Madam Vice President. We appreciate you being here with us. Please. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You know. <laughs> Couldn't help it. Um, thank you, Mr. Johnson, for your leadership, for your vision, for your warmth, and for your love. On this day, we celebrate Dr. King and this monument to him. Love is pervasive all around us right now. Um, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, thank you for what you are doing. I have known the speaker for a very long time. Having started my elected career in San Francisco, she has always been who she is today, a fighter for working people and a voice for those who must be seen and known and to whom all deserve the kind of dignity that God intended. Thank you. Chairwoman Joyce Beatty and my, I, I will call you still my colleagues at the Congressional Black Caucus. <laughs> Thank you all for your leadership. And to the King family, Martin Luther King III, Dexter Scott King and Bernice King for their commitment to carry on the legacy of their family, multi-generational legacy. And to everyone here today, Thank you, there are so many leaders who are here. And as we all know, this monument has, in many ways, been distinguished from almost every other monument, in fact, every other monument, along this beautiful tidal basin. Because this monument, for most of us here, is dedicated to a man who lived among us. Many of us were alive when Dr. King lived. This monument, whatever your age, is dedicated to a man whose voice we can still hear, whose words still echo, not only across this city, but throughout our country and our world. Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was a prophet. He was a prophet in that he saw the present exactly as it was, being clear-eyed, and he saw the future as it could be. And he pushed our nation toward that future. And it's important to remember, Dr. King pushed even as on a daily basis his character was being maligned. He pushed even as his family on a daily basis was being threatened. He pushed 
even as his very life was in jeopardy. And toward what would be the end of that short life, he pushed even harder, drawing a straight line between racial injustice and economic injustice, demanding more for black people, for people of color, for working people, for all people. And it may not sound radical now, it was radical then. So as we remember his life and celebrate the anniversary of this beautiful memorial, let us be guided by those same connections he made as they exist today. Racial injustice today is inextricably linked to economic injustice, to the impact of the climate crisis, to the impact of COVID-19, and to the threats to our democracy. And I believe then, knowing and seeing that, the path forward is clear. We must put people to work in good union jobs and invest in the care, the child care, the home care that people need to be able to go to work. We must reform our criminal justice system and our immigration system. We must defend and strengthen the right that unlocks all other rights, the right to vote. And as we all know, in 2013, the Voting Rights Act that Dr. King and so many others fought for was gutted by the Supreme Court decision in Shelby v. Holder. That decision opened the floodgates for the anti-voter laws we see being passed in states throughout our country today. And to be sure, we should not have to keep fighting so hard to secure our fundamental rights, but fight we must and fight we will. So right now there are two bills in front of the United States Congress that would help to restore the Voting Rights Act and strengthen the right to vote for all Americans. The Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. These two bills are among the broadest efforts to protect and strengthen the right to vote since Dr. King died. But yesterday, as Senate Democrats voted to advance the Freedom to Vote Act, Senate Republicans voted against even debating it. Even debating it as though it's not a debatable point. They refuse to even come to the table to talk about it. Well, today, I am reminded of the words we all are, the many words we've heard, including from our young leaders. The words of Dr. King's partner in that struggle, Coretta Scott King. And she said, and I will paraphrase, freedom is never really won. You earn it and you win it with every generation, with their sweat, with their tears, and with their blood. The leaders of the civil rights movement and the coalition they built won the Voting Rights Act. These were young men and women. After all, we remember Dr. King was only 39 years old when he died. And yet, they knew their power they knew that there is real power when your cause is just. And they used then that power to push Democrats and Republicans to pass that landmark bill. So today, as a nation, we must summon our own power 
As leaders, we must leverage our own power. And we all have a role to play. And the President and I are clear on ours. We are and must be unwavering in this fight. And we must use our voice to call out any effort to obstruct justice. And to call for justice everywhere. Remember, um, and Dr. King knew this, America is not defined by her perfection. America is defined by our commitment to perfecting. And in our nation, that will forever be the work forward. As Dr. King did, we must keep believing a better future is possible. And as Dr. King did, we must keep pushing toward that future. So as I have the great honor of introducing our president, let me end today by recognizing the impact that this memorial has had. For 10 years, think about it, for a decade, visitors from all over the world have come to this very place. The words that are etched in these walls, now etched in their hearts, and on their smartphones. <laughs> the history that is told here because of this place is now part of their own. And I know that when they leave here, they do so determined to do their part to build a better future. So on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our world, thank you all for making this memorial possible. And now it is my great and distinct honor to introduce a phenomenal leader who was here when this memorial was first unveiled, a leader who I know, because I see it every day, draws so much inspiration and reminds so many of the work and the words of Dr. King, our President of the United States, Joe Biden. I Thank got you. it. Thank you. Thank you, Kamala. Thank you all so very much. Mr. President. <laughs> Harry, uh, thank you for your stewardship. You know, uh, here uh, in the heart of the Capitol, of the United States of America, the tensions and the heat of the nation are vividly on display. Dr. King stands determined and brave, uh, looking out to the promised land. Across the tidal basin stands another giant of our history, Thomas Jefferson, whose words declared the very idea of America that we are all created equal, endowed by or created with certain inalienable rights, we all deserve to be treated equally throughout our lives. To state the obvious, and no audience knows it better than this one, we've never lived up to that idea. But we've never walked away from it fully. We've never walked away. In his sermon to the uh, march in Washington, Dr. King called on all of America to live up to the full meaning and promise of our Declaration of Independence. And so, they stand here in perpetuity, in timely and timeless conversation that inspires us and challenges us, reminds us how far we've come, where we need to go, and how far, how much longer the journey is. And it's a conversation that shapes our days and that we must carry forward. Madam Vice President, Madam Speaker, Chair of the Black Caucus, PD, Congressional Black Caucus members, the Memorial Foundation, leaders of faith and community, distinguished guests. From here, 
we see the ongoing push and pull between progress and struggle over the self-evident truths of our democracy. And in our nation, we now face an inflection point in the battle, literally, for the soul of America. And it's up to us together to choose who we want to be and what we want to be. I know, I know the progress does not come fast enough. It never has. And the process of governing is frustrating and sometimes dispiriting. But I also know what's possible if we keep the pressure up, if we never give up, if we keep the faith. We're at an inflection point here. I know I've maybe overused that phrase, but it is an inflection point in American history in delivering on economic justice. For it was the dignity of work that Dr. King was in Memphis on that fateful day in April, helping sanitation workers, not only for better pay and safer conditions, but to be granted more dignity as human beings. In our time, it's about recognizing that for much too long, we've allowed a narrowed and cramped view of the promise of America, a view that America is a zero-sum game, particularly of the recent past, if you succeed, I fail. If you get ahead, I fall behind. And maybe worst of all, if I can hold you down, I lift myself up instead of what it should be. And it's just self-evident. If you do well, we all do well. That's keeping the promise of America. I've never seen a time when working folks did well that the wealthy didn't do very well. Look, it's the core of our administration's economic vision, and it's a fundamental paradigm shift for this nation. For the first time in a couple generations, we're going to be investing in working families, putting them first and helping them get ahead, rather than the wealthy and the biggest and most powerful people out there. We're investing in black families with rescue checks and tax cuts that will reduce black poverty by 34%. Black child poverty by more than 50 percent this year. And we're aggressively, with the leadership of some of the people I'm looking at right now, combating housing discrimination to create a generation of wealth. How did every other person make it to the middle class from a working class circumstance? Just like my dad did. Build equity in a house. Granted, it was small. Granted, it wasn't much. But it was enough to build a little equity. We'll use the federal government's purchasing power to unlock billions of dollars in new opportunities of minority-owned small businesses and access to government contracts. Is there any doubt that providing more people with just a little more breathing room to take care of their families, generate a little bit of wealth that they can pass on to their children, and create jobs in their communities would uplift the entire country, all the country, everyone. And as the economy recovers, we are determined and focused on rebuilding it over the long run. No one should have to hold their breath as they cross a rundown bridge to determine whether it's safe enough or a dangerous intersection in their hometown. A nation, every American, every child should be able to turn on a faucet and drink water that's not contaminated by lead or anything else. As a nation, everyone should have access to affordable high-speed internet. Gone the days when you have to pull up to a McDonald's and sit in the parking lot with your child to do their homework when there's virtual learning going on. Dr. King said, of all the forms of inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and most inhumane. This is a once-in-a-century pandemic that's hit this country hard and especially the African-American community. It's like you've all lost someone to the virus or know someone who has lost a loved one. One in 600 black Americans have died from COVID-19. It's been reported that black children are more than twice as likely as white children to have lost a parent or a caregiver to COVID-19 to have to experience the trauma and loss. Many of my colleagues in the Congress are working on what we have to now work on even more 
more fervently, and that is mental health care, helping people through the difficult periods we have. It's been devastating. But we can find purpose in pain. We can find purpose in this pain. Equity is the center of my administration's COVID-19 response. The vaccination rates among black adults is now essentially on par with white adults. In the midst of this pandemic, we're building an Affordable Care Act to extend coverage to lower health care costs for millions of black families. We're also working to lower prescription drug costs by giving Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices. And how do you know the plan will work? Because the drug companies are spending millions of bucks to try to stop it. That's how you know. Together, we're making health care a right, not a privilege in this nation. And for the millions, the millions of you who feel financially squeezed in raising a child while caring for an aging parent, a so-called sandwich generation, who want to make elder care affordable and accessible so your aging loved ones can live with greater independence and dignity. We also want to make sure child care costs for most families are cut at least in half. No working family, if we, if we get what you all are helping me get done, no working family in America will pay more than 7% of their income on child care for any child under five. We want to give raises to millions of care workers and home workers so they can increase their capacity, increase their knowledge, increase their opportunities. Health workers and child care workers are disproportionately women, women of color and immigrants, <clears throat> workers like the ones Dr. King stood for when he marched and gave his life. Look, folks. Just imagine, instead of consigning millions of our children to under-resourced schools, we gave every single child in America access to an education at age three and age four, a quality preschool. We can afford to do this. We can't afford not to do it. And we do know, no matter what the background or circumstance the child comes from, when given that opportunity, they have a better than 58% chance of making it all the way through 12 years without getting themselves in trouble and maybe go on beyond that. This will change lives forever. So will historic investments in higher education, significantly increasing Pell Grants to help millions of black students and lower income families attend community colleges and four year schools. I tell you, let me be clear. In the shadow of the Morehouse men, <laughs> I hear a lot about that, guys. <laughs> and with a Howard alumni, <laughs> I keep making the case, if you excuse the point of personal privilege, we should say in the Senate, the best HBCU in the country is Delaware State. <laughs> That's where I got started. Come on. But here's what we've done. In addition, putting the president of Delaware State, who used to work for me, doctor, he, uh, in charge of all of this. <laughs> We're committed to nearly $5 billion this year in historic investments with more historically black colleges and universities to make every single student give them a shot at the good paying jobs. And you all know what I mean, but for anybody watching this, one of the problems is Black students in college are just have every single capability any other student does. But guess what? Because they don't have great endowments, they can't compete for those government contracts that are out there that the big schools are able to go out and get. Cybersecurity, for example, starting salaries, 100, 125,000 bucks, but you don't get to get that contract unless you have laboratories, unless you have the facilities you can, in fact, train on. We also know this is about the promise of America. Economic injustice also means delivering environmental justice to communities on fence line communities, dividing homes in toxic areas. My state is one of the highest cancer rates in the history of Amer in America, because I lived in a fence line community called Claymont, Delaware. We used to get up in the morning, not a joke, when I get driven to the little school, I went up the street, turn on the windshield wiper in the fall, in the fall, the first frost, and literally be an oil slick in the window, not a joke. An oil slick in the window. That's why an awful lot of us, including me, have bronchial asthma. 
It means reducing pollution so our children can develop and avoid these consequences. Every one of you have an alley in your state. We call it Cancer Alley in our state, going down Route 13. Look, it means building up our resilience to the climate crisis, the next extreme weather events. And these have been of biblical proportions, biblical proportions. 178 mile top winds in a hurricane down in Louisiana. More people dying in Queens in their basements because 20 inches of rain, they flooded and couldn't get out of their basements. They drowned. Superstorms, droughts, wildfire, hurricanes. This is the promise for America, urban and rural and all across America, not just for any one area. And as we fight for economic justice to fulfill the promise of America for all Americans, the work continues on delivering equal justice under the law. Look, I know the frustration we all feel that more than one year after George Floyd's murder and the conviction of his murderer about six months ago, meaningful police reform in George's name is still not passed Congress. I remember many times meeting with a little daughter, and she'd say to me, my daddy's changing history. He's going to change history. But we haven't fulfilled that yet. I understand. You got to keep fighting. Let me be clear, though. We're going to continue to fight for real police reform legislation. And the fight's not anywhere near over. Despite Republican obstruction, my administration is active. We've already announced changes to the federal law enforcement policies, a ban on chokeholds, restriction on no-knock warrants, requirements that federal agents wear and activate body cameras, ending Department of Justice use of private prisons, rescinding the previous administration's guidance to U.S. attorneys to require the harshest of penalties. The Justice Department has opened a pattern and practice investigation of systematic police misconduct in police departments in Phoenix, Louisville, and Minneapolis. Just because we can't get it done in the states, we are not standing back. But we have much more to do. And this is these important steps. My administration also wants to advance some meaningful police reform that includes additional executive actions to live up to America's promise of equal justice under the law. Our work continues to create a safer and stronger communities in critical ways. With my American Rescue Plan, and thank you and the Congress for supporting it, everybody kind of forgets that was $1.9 billion, trillion dollars. We got a hell of a heck of a lot done with that. That it did so well, people don't even know where it came from. No, I'm serious. Think about it. Like, what'd you do for me lately? Well, we had $1.9 billion we took care of. Well, we made historic investments in community policing and violence intervention programs. And we're shown to reduce some of these programs to reduce violence by 60 percent. We're expanding summer programs and job opportunities and service and support to keep young people safe and out of trouble. We're helping formerly incarcerated people successfully reenter their communities. In the past, you get 25 bucks and a, buck and, 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 a, and a bus ticket. You go back right into the bridge you just were there before. You should have access to Pell Grants. You should have access to the power, the housing. You should have access to all the things. You paid your price. And we shouldn't put you back in the spot where you have no options. We're also working to stem the flow of firearms from rogue gun dealers to curb the, academic, the epidemic of gun violence. I know I get criticized for being the guy who passed the assault weapons ban. I'm proud of having passed the assault weapons ban. But here's the deal. We heard. Dr. King paraphrased Micah. He said, give us the ballot and we will place judges on the benches of the South who will do justly and love mercy. Well, in just nine months, we've appointed more black women to the federal circuit courts and more former public defenders of the bench than any administration in all of American history because of you. We're going to change it. We did it in a record time, and we're just getting started because of all of you in the audience here. You've been the engine behind all of this. But we also know this. To make real the full promise of America, we have to protect that fundamental right, the right to vote, the sacred right to vote. You know, it's democracy's threshold liberty. With it, anything's possible. Without it, nothing is. Today, the right to vote and the rule of law are under unrelenting assault from Republican governors, attorneys general, secretary of state, state legislators. And they're following my predecessor, the last president, into a deep, deep black hole in the abyss. 
No, I really mean it. Think about it. That's what got me involved in civil rights as a kid when I was 26 years old. It gave me, I never planned, I love reading about how Biden knew he was going to run for president. Hell, I didn't know I was even going to be able to run for the county council. I didn't even want to. <laughs> but look, this struggle is no longer just over who gets to vote or making it easier for eligible people to vote. It's about who gets to count the votes or they should count it all. Jim Crow in the 21st century is now a sinister combination of voter suppression and elective sub election subversion. My fellow Americans, I thought at one point that I had been able to do something good as chairman of the Judiciary Committee. I was able to get every member of the committee, including some of the most conservative members that ever served, clearly who had racist backgrounds, to vote to extend the Voting Rights Act for 25 years. I thought, whoa, one of the proudest things I ever did as a senator. But guess what? This means that some state legislatures want to make it harder for you to vote. And if you do vote, they want to be able to tell you whether or not your vote counts. That's not happened before. They want to, the ability to reject the final vote and ignore the will of the people. If their preferred candidate, black or white or Asian or Latino, doesn't matter if that their candidate doesn't win. And they're targeting not just voters of color, as I said, but every voter who doesn't vote the way they want. I have to admit to you, have been as a senator in my whole 36-year career involved in, as I've worked with a lot of folks out here in civil rights issues. I thought, man, you can't turn this back, I, that you could defeat hate. But we could actually defeat hate. But the most un-American thing that any of us can imagine, the most undemocratic and the most unpatriotic, and yet sadly not unprecedented, time and again we've witnessed threats to the right to vote and free and fair elections come to fruition. Each time we fought back. And we've got to continue to fight back today. I want to thank Martin Luther King III for leading marches on voting rights during the anniversary of the march on Washington on August 28th. Vice President and I and our colleagues here have spent our careers doing this work. It's central to our administration. On the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, I directed each and every federal agency to promote access to voting from each agency heeding that call. For example, the Department of Veterans Affairs, I asked them to make it easier for veterans and their families to register and to vote at VA facilities, so it would be open. In addition, the U.S. Department of Justice has doubled the voting rights enforcement staff. we got a long way to go, though. It's using authorities to challenge the onslaught of state laws undermining voting rights, whether in old or new ways. To something like 20 percent of the — half the Republicans are registered Republicans, I am not your president. Donald Trump is still your president. As we Catholics say, oh, my God. <laughs> but look, the focus is going to remain on discrimination and racial discrimina discriminatory laws. Georgia's various new anti-voting laws. And let's be clear about Georgia, Dr. King's home state and the home state of someone who has literally stood in his shoes as I think some of you guys knew this was the next line was coming. That's why you had the Jets come up. Stood in his shoes as a Morehouse man. That's what I keep getting from Cedric. Oh, anyway. And as a preacher in the pulpit of Ebenezer, United States Senator Raphael Warnock, the first black senator in Georgia's history. Senator Warnock won his election in the battle of ideas. He earned the trust and confidence of a broad coalition of voters in Georgia. In response of Republicans of Georgia, what was it? It's not to try winning on the merits and ideas. It's by changing the rules to make it harder for people to vote, deny the franchise. The vice president will lead in our administration's efforts, and we've supported Democrats pressing to enact critical voting rights bills since day one of this administration, making sure we have unanimous support. But each and every time, 
Senate Republicans block it by refusing even to talk about it. They're afraid to even just debate the bills in the U.S. Senate, as they did again yesterday, even on a bill that includes provisions that they've traditionally supported. It's unfair, it's unconscionable, and it's un-American. And this battle's far from over. The door has not been closed. John Lewis Voting Rights Act will soon come up for a vote, named after our dear friend we still miss dearly, but whose voice we hear every day in our hearts and our conscience. It's a law that helped lead the reauthorization, as I said, for 25 years that I served of the, of the, the, and the Senate Judiciary Committee expanding the Voting Rights Act. Traditionally received bipartisan support. We have to keep up the fight and get it done. And I know the moment we're in. You know the moment we're in. I know the stakes. You know the stakes. This is far from over. And finally, we're confronting the stains of what remains the deep stain on the soul of the nation, hate and white supremacy. You know, there's a tough through line of subjugation and enslaved people from our earliest days to the reigns of radicalized terror, the KKK, the Dr. King being assassinated. And through that, though that line continues to be the torches emerging from dark shadows in Charlottesville, carrying out Nazi banners and chanting anti-Semitic bile and Ku Klux Klan flags, and the violent, deadly insurrection on the Capitol nine months ago. It was about white supremacy, in my view. The rise of hate crimes against Asian Americans during the pandemic, and the rise of anti-Semitism here in America and around the world. The through line is that hate never goes away. It never, I thought, and all the years I've been involved, I thought once we got through it, it would go away. But it doesn't. It only hides. It only hides until some seeming legitimate person breathes some oxygen under the rocks where they're hiding and gives us some breath. I've said it before, and all my colleagues here know it. According to the United States intelligence community, domestic terrorism from white supremacists is the most lethal terrorist threat in the homeland. To that end, our administration is carrying out the first ever comprehensive effort to tackle the threat passed by domestic, posed by domestic terrorism, including white supremacy. We're doing so by taking action to reduce online radicalism and recruitment to violence. We're also disrupting networks that inspire violence and domestic terrorists by providing resources to communities to build resilience. We cannot and must not give hate any safe harbor, any safe harbor. My fellow Americans, standing here reminding of the goal of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which Dr. King led, and I quote, he said his goal was, quote, redeem the soul of America. That's what's at stake here, the soul of America. And we know that it's not the work of a single day or a single administration or even a single generation. But here we stand with Dr. King to show out of struggle, there's progress. Out of despair, there's hope. From the promise of equality and opportunity, of jobs, justice, and freedom, we see black excellence. American excellence, black history as American history, and a defining source of the might of this nation. That's why we're here today, to renew our own courage in the shadow and the light and on the shoulders of Dr. King, Coretta Scott King, and all those known and unknown who gave their whole souls to this work. The courage to confront wrong and to try to do right, the courage to heal the broken places of the nation, the courage to see America whole, to acknowledge where we fall short, to devote ourselves to the perfection of the union that we love and we must protect. For if we can summon the courage to do these things, we'll have done our duty, honored our commitments, brought the dream of Dr. King just a little bit closer to reality. It's the highest of callings. It's the most sacred of charges. And it's what, with the help of God, we can do now. So let's go forth from this sacred place 
tumbled in turmoil with hope and promise of a nation always seeking, always thriving, always keeping the faith. Because, folks, you know, uh, I know my colleagues in the Senate used to always kid me for quoting Irish poets on the floor. They thought I did it because I was Irish. It's not the reason. They're just the best poets in the world. There's a line from, a, and I believe this to be true, there's a line from a poem of Cura Troy. It says, at once in a lifetime, that tidal wave of justice rises up and hope and history rhyme. It's not the whole quote. I won't bore you at all, but hope and history rhyme. I believe the American people, the vast majority, are with us. I think they see much more clearly what you've all been fighting for your whole lives now. It's in stark relief. The bad news, we had a president who appealed to the prejudice. The good news is it, he took the, he ripped the Band-Aid off, made it absolutely clear what's at stake. And I think the American people will follow us. But guess what? Whether they will or not, we have no choice. We have to continue to fight. God bless you all. May God protect our troops. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Minister Wintley Phipps.